Joined by one of the newest inductees with the Vancouver Broadcast Hall of Fame at the Vancouver Canadians here, Bob Robertson, longtime voice for the Spokane squad. First up, Bob, congratulations on the induction the other night. Well, thank you. It, uh, originally, it was a, a nice surprise because I, you know, I've had a few things happen to me along the way, and but I've never received honors like that uh, in a country where I don't live. <laughs> Got to be nice. You were the only one I saw wearing a Vancouver Canadians hat, especially around your own team. Yeah, and I was afraid that uh, perhaps I would lose my meal money for the trip when my <laughs> players from Spokane saw that uh, the folks from the uh, from the uh, kangaroo court haven't caught up with me yet <laughs> <laughs> let's look back I'll be a years back and I'm going back aging myself myself as well let's look back how did you get involved in broadcasting and who started you well uh, sports broadcasting wasn't a, where I went originally uh, originally when I was in the sixth grade at model school down on just off Camby by the City Hall uh, I was uh, hired by the uh, CBC and CBR down in the Vancouver Hotel to be a part of the uh, British Columbia schools broadcast and from that they started using me as a as a child actor on dramatic shows that were pretty Produced there with a pretty a pretty good group of actors along the way, so I learned some tricks from them. So I got interested in broadcasting. Uh, we moved away from Vancouver up to Saskatoon during the Second World War. After that, and I kind of lost touch with it again until I got uh, into high school, and I was living at Point Roberts at the Boundary Bay yeah. side and going to Blaine High School both by bus every day. <laughs> and I, I kind of got interested once again. Only this time, I got interested in, in sports broadcasting and. So uh, after spending a little bit of time at uh, at Western Washington, and it was then Western Washington College of Education, right. now just university in, in Bellingham, I signed a baseball contract to play professional baseball, which was really my first love. That's what I really wanted to do. And uh, about the same time, I was offered the broadcasting job in Wenatchee with the Western International Class B Wenatchee team. And I had to mull it over and decide which one to go with. And, and I think the fact that I I was a poor college student and needed money immediately. I went with the one that started paying next week instead of in the, at the end of April. <laughs> so that was what got me off in the professional broadcasting ranks. And from there, it was, you know, move up from a small market to a larger market and work your way up and just keep at it and work hard and uh, hope for the best. Was there any one specific individual, and of course one that comes to my mind is Vince Scully. Uh, two things, one is was there anyone that you looked up to to idolize, and secondly, did you have any contact and working relationship with Vince Scully? I did not with Scully, although I have often said I'm not going to retire until he does, and he <laughs> went the other day and said he's coming back again next year, so I may be stuck, but uh, uh, there were a number of people uh, in the Seattle broadcasting market who were very kind to me when I first showed up on the scene as a youngster. I was uh, suddenly thrust in, into their midst to do things like the state high school basketball tournaments for my local station. And uh, there were guys there, uh, oh, Ted Bell and uh, Rod Belcher and Clay Huntington and people like that, uh, Pat Hayes. They, they gave me a lot of good advice and helped me out. They squired me around because I didn't have a car and uh, made sure I didn't get lost in downtown Seattle. So people like that were very, very good to me. And I do have to say that the administrators at High School were good to me. I, they, I think, held out very little hope that I would amount to anything, but they uh, they did move heaven and earth to get me into college at Bellingham so I could play some football and baseball and also follow the radio thing. So I, there were a lot of people along the way. And uh, uh, I, I was helped by uh, having audition tapes moved along a couple of times. That's how I got to Bellingham, from Bellingham to Wenatchee with somebody connected with the station, uh, recommended me to the Wenatchee station. The same thing when I moved from Wenatchee to Tacoma. Uh, I actually applied for a job in Yakima. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't open, and they sent the tape along to a station, co-owned station, and I ended up in Tacoma, which was much better. Uh, met my wife there, and that's, that was uh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. But it, uh, yeah, there were a lot of people who did help. I, uh, one, of the, one of them was the broadcaster at Notre Dame when I went back there and um, and uh, I showed up on the practice field one day, brand new in town. Nobody knew me, and uh, he spotted me and uh, across the field and walked across the field and introduced himself, the voice of the Fighting Riders with a 600-station network. And he was kind enough to walk over and uh, shake my hand and say, anything I can do to help, let me know. And, you know, you meet a lot of good people like that along the way. Yeah, that's got to be a nice feeling to have somebody walk across the field and say that to you. Yeah, his name was Joe Boland. He, was, uh, he had played under Newton. 
Rockney at Notre Dame. He was a lineman, and uh, he, he was the voice of the Fighting Irish all those years. You could hear him anywhere in the world on Saturday broadcasting Notre Dame games, and he was kind enough to, to greet me as the newcomer in town. Games changed over the course of years. What's one of the biggest changes you've seen from a broadcaster's perspective? Well, which game? <laughs> Take your pick. Well, football, uh, obviously it's in the midst of changing right now. It's going from the uh, the old days of the, the hard running and lots of hard blocking to everybody is a receiver and they're all split all over the field and uh, we have a quarterback at Washington State who last year in, in two of his games attempted 85 and 89 forward passes and he probably will top that this year at some point. Uh, it, the game has, has gone literally to a, an aerial game now and I don't know how long that'll last before the defenses catch up but the days of a 7-6 a or a 7-3 victory I think those are gone, and uh, from now on, it's going to be uh, you know 46 to 43 and things like that in college ball. At least the pros may take a little longer because they have a few more bigger, faster bodies to play defense. But right at this moment, the college game is uh, is uh, basketball on grass. And baseball, what's one of the changes there? Well, baseball, uh, we're changing rules now. You have such things as the uh, don't block home plate, uh, which I think takes the catcher out of the, where he can make plays often and there'll be guys you know sliding by reaching out with one hand and that sort of thing I think the the biggest change in baseball though since I came into it is the length of time it takes to play a game for heaven's sake uh, you, here in Vancouver we used to have double headers when you couldn't play Sunday baseball and the old Capilinas down at uh, fifth and hemlock would play their games on Saturday they would play a double header and they'd start at two and eight and you'd play two o'clock game, everybody would go home and you come back for the 8 o'clock game and you'd still be home in time for bed. A game over 2 hours, 2 hours and 15 minutes was, was a normal game, maybe, maybe on the long side. Now, uh, you're, you're talking about three and a half hours to four hours for a baseball game. And uh, while you've added an hour and a half to the game, I don't think you've added an hour and a half of excitement to the game. So it takes a really good baseball fan to come out on a regular basis. I hope they find some way without uh, upsetting the balance of the game. I hope they find some way to, to shorten it down, maybe make the guys stop fixing their gloves after every pitch and the pitchers wandering around and managers have to, have to take some and blame too. They, uh, they, you know, they want to sig put in signs and signals, very complicated ones on every pitch, not just when they want something to happen. And I guess I, we as broadcasters have to take a little of it because we want two minutes and 15 seconds between innings to get our commercials in. If we could get by with only one minute and 15 seconds, we'd chop 18 minutes out of a baseball <laughs> game right there. So we do have to take some blame. You look at some of the players, we were talking off camera with some of the players that have come through our Canadian system. And we talk about James Paxton currently with the uh, Seattle Mariners, Michael Saunders out of Victoria. Uh, we talk about Jeff Francis out of the Delta area as well, Larry Walker. Why do you think, even, even American players, why do you think they're growing and the game is becoming so successful and so positive? Well, I think worldwide. Uh, of course, uh, Canada was a little bit ahead of the, the curve on that, but worldwide you have television, and uh, kids everywhere are able to see baseball. They, uh, they can pick their heroes and, and follow them and try to emulate them, and so they're, they're learning the game a lot, lot earlier. They uh, sit there and, and watch a telecast, and they have a former Major League star telling them all about the game and why that play didn't work and why this one did and what you should be doing and they see that they can go to baseball camps now all over and, and have professional instruction we didn't have that uh, when I was growing up I wanted to be a baseball player I had um, a little advantage young in that my dad played minor league professional baseball and he wanted me to play so I got good advice from him, but uh, you still, you didn't have that exposure to the major league stars telling you, you can buy a tape and take it home and it'll tell you exactly how to swing and you swing a bat and you look at it over and over and over again, you're ready to play as soon as you get finished with that. So I, it's, it's exposure to the game and the game has kind of attracted the kids on its own. What do you tell the parents that 
they're a pushy parent and they want their son or daughter, regardless of the sport, to sort of emulate what they wanted to do and they would never ever get to that level. Well, I got a good look at that because I was a football basketball official for 20 years of my life and uh, the, I always said that the best thing could happen to little kid baseball or any sport is for the parents not to come to the games. Uh, they come out there, they embarrass the kids. Uh, if a kid has a bad day, by the time he gets in the car to go home, he's in tears because he has to ride home with dad and mom and brothers and sisters. Uh, I just think you should let the kids play uh, the, the Little League World Series, uh, for example. I, you know, I watch some of that, but I'm really not in favor of kids age 12 doing something that will be the highlight of their entire lives. Those kids who played there, and especially the winners, what are they going to do individually in the future that will top that? So I let the kids alone. We used to go out find an empty lot and a baseball that still had part of the cover on it and we'd play all day long. We'd play the one a cat where you work your way up to hit. The, the best guys would be at the plate most of the day, sure, but the kids who were in right field were still playing baseball out there. We had a good time doing it. It was fun. Now kids have to have uniforms and a schedule and umpires and hopefully television before they want to go out and play. We used to go out and play all day long until it was too dark to play or mom said, you get your tail home for dinner. <laughs> What's been the highlight of your career, if you can pick one? Well, other than meeting my wife when uh, we were both well said, pretty well young, said. yeah, and uh, uh, we had a good long time together. But uh, from, a, from a standpoint of broadcasting, I don't know whether there was any one. I think, you know, probably the most memorable was the first day at Notre Dame. Uh, you, you, working in Tacoma, Washington, and a little, radio, a little radio, a little television station, and suddenly somebody calls you on the phone and says, will you fly back to South Bend, Indiana? Indiana, we want to interview you, and you know, I didn't know that I really wanted to do that, but so I went back, I figured, wow, what the heck, they're not going to hire anybody from out on the West Coast uh, suddenly to do Notre Dame football and basketball, but I flew back because they were paying my way, so I got back there, and they interviewed me and said, well, now we'll, we'll talk it over, and, uh, and uh, we'll let you know this afternoon, so I went and saw a movie in South Bend, an afternoon movie. And when I got through the movie, I called back expecting them to say, well, thank you for coming. They offered me the job. And, I, and so I couldn't turn it down then. I, you know, it was just, it was too appealing to it. I think I was 20, just barely 26. And it was, it was too appealing Notre Dame, for heaven's sake. That's kind of the apex of college sports. The, the NFL wasn't that big yet. So college sports were really big. So we did take it, uh, loved Notre Dame, hated the weather in the Midwest, and eventually just made our way back to the West Coast where we started from and, uh, and settled there. We decided then that that's where we wanted to be. You're obviously enjoying your time with uh, Spokane, listening to you up here call the middle three innings of the games all the time, and you're just full of enthusiasm from our point of view, and you're just having fun. You bring life to the game, and, and that's one of the big key roles that you have is to make the fans at home like they're a part of the game. Well, I, uh, that's what we're paid to do. Uh, we're entertainers. Uh, we're reporters. We want to be accurate, but we're also entertainers, so we want to uh, make people feel like they're right in the middle of the game. I, I don't know how many years I recreated baseball games and, and other games as well, hockey, basketball, and soccer, uh, recreations where I was not with the team on the road. I'd be in the studio at home, and uh, we did that. And you tried to make that as entertaining as you could without being ridiculous, of course. You could, you know, I, you could do things that would mess the whole procedure up, but try not to do that. But, uh, you know, you're, you're an entertainer as well as a reporter when you broadcast play-by-play. -play. And I, I think it's a shame not to convey the, the enthusiasm level of the game itself if you don't convey that to the audience, uh, I think you're, you're missing a bet. You're doing a disservice. I remember a longtime broadcaster in Vancouver, very synonymous with sports in British Columbia and Canada, Jim Robson, telling me about the same thing, about recreating games and sound effects. Yeah, Jim and his partner, uh, they, they had a, a pretty good set of sound effects. Uh, uh, mine came along better later uh, when I was able to go down to spring training and record things and get them on uh, the tapes, the, the, the cartridges that would uh, give you the crack of the bat. 
bat, and then the cartridge would stop automatically queuing up to the next track of the bat. And all I had to do was say, here's the pitch, swing it, and I push the button, and I'd whack. <laughs> that all helped. But uh, it helped to know the game because you, you were the eyes of the game. You had to know what was going on on the field in order to be accurate with your description of the game. So it was important to know the game. And lastly, you're enjoying your time with Spokane. How's the travel helping out for you? Travel is kind of crazy for me. I live on the west side in a place called University Place near Tacoma. And of course, the Spokane Ball Club is in Spokane, 307 miles away from my house. You get the idea that I've done it. But on top of that, I do the Washington State football. And they're in Pullman, which is just south of Spokane by an hour and a quarter. So I, I've traveled over the mountain pass, I, I think, as many times as anybody in history, probably. 530 Cougar football games. And I don't know how many baseball games. I'm also doing the same thing, the three innings in the middle with the Tacoma Pacific Coast League team. So I get to see people from Ladner and Victoria every once in a while. Well, you're enjoying yourself. You're doing a great job. And on behalf of everybody that's connected with baseball in British Columbia and Canada that listen to the broadcast, I know that we just love listening to your voice and what you bring, the excitement, the enthusiasm to the game itself. It's just our pleasure. And I really thank you very much for doing it. Well, thank you. Thank everybody involved with the award. It's going to be one I treasure. I, you know, until the very end, I will treasure that award because it has a very special meaning to it and it was presented here in Vancouver. Okay, thanks, Bob. Thank you.